I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IAP, in the Elliott School of International Affairs of the George Washington University in our nation's capital. With me is Sabina Alkire, director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in Oxford's Department of International Development. We are most grateful that you've joined us today for today's talk the Revised Arab Multidimensional Poverty Index 2021, presented by Sama Sleiman of the UN Economic and Social Commission for West Asia, or ESQA, with discussion by Javier Mancero of the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, or ECLAC. Now, you might have noticed a theme there, in the affiliation of our two speakers. Indeed, today's event introduces a new direction in our series on multidimensional measurement, as each episode will highlight contribution by, contributions by colleagues in the UN system and in other international organizations, especially into the conversation of how to best use these methods in practice. In just a few moments, Sabina will present our rationale for taking the series in this direction, and then we'll introduce today's speakers. But I first would like to thank a few folks on my own and to briefly introduce you to our institute, IIEP. Now, this is the ninth in the series, uh, co-sponsored by IIEP, OFI, and the Human Development Report Office, or HDRO, of the United Nations Development Program. We'd like to express our appreciation to HDRO Director Pedro Conceixao and to Yanshin Zhang and Eriberto Tapia of HDRO and to Frank Vollmer and Jakob Dirksen, both of OFI, for hunting down the great papers and presentations that will make up the series over the next several weeks. Here at IAP, I am grateful to Kyle Renner and his professional team of student staff who make sure that all the technology gods are appeased and for getting the word out. And finally, to the many benefactors of IEP, we thank you for your continued support, which makes all our activities possible, and especially to IIEP's new executive circle, headed by co-chairs Deborah Lair and Frank Wong. Now about our institute. IIEP supports research, enhances teaching and learning, and convenes nonpartisan discussions of key questions facing the international community. Last week on Friday, we had a remarkable episode in our China conference series with Lian Zhou of Peking University on the pollution abatement in China. Next week on Wednesday the 21st in our Envisioning India series, Harsha Singh, the former Deputy Director General of the WTO, will outline India's trade policy with discussion by Brandeis economist Judy Dean, India's former Commerce, Sec former Commerce Secretary Rajiv Kerr, and the Elliott School's own resident expert on South Asia, Dean Alyssa Ayres. The, the present series on measurement bring scholars and practitioners together to discuss multidimensional poverty and related issues. Last time, Suman Seth of Leeds University presented a paper on multidimensional poverty and inclusive growth in India. Next week, Ricardo Santos of UNU Wider will discuss wealth inequalities in Mozambique. If you miss any of our events, you can watch them asynchronously on our YouTube channel, IIEP. GW. So now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Sabina for her comments. Sabina. Thank you so much, James. And it's lovely to be with all of you and to look forward to this seminar and to the seminar series. As James said, we had previously, um, in the last series of episodes, focused on different papers related to the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. Um, which UNDP, together with OFI and building on the work of James Foster at IAP, um, used to try to understand and display different aspects of poverty globally. 
But that is only one of the many different ways in which a counting-based multidimensional poverty methodology or a multidimensional methodology uh, more generally can be applied. And one of the interesting factors is that we are in a moment in which many individuals, but particularly many different in international institutions, are using this measurement technology in innovative ways. And so um, in the next series of weeks of talks, you will hear many of these applications. So as James mentioned, and we'll come back to, we have ESQA um, from a regional statistics commission presenting this week, um, but then the World Bank um, or World Food Program or World Health Organization, um, UNICEF and UNEP, other institutions also have innovative ways of taking up this technology, but then blending it with their own data sets or their own areas of expertise. And so coming up with a new mixture, a new recipe, something that has a bit of a, a spark, a different, different taste to what there has been before. So it's a fantastic period of innovation. And this new seminar series, which it always will have an international institution presenting, participating in it, um, is trying to help us all keep abroad, uh, uh, abreast with this kind of cross-fertilization and, and hybridization of this methodology as it goes out in different directions. Today, I'm really looking forward to, personally, we said at the very beginning that the global MPI is a measure of acute poverty. And so it is perhaps not an appropriate measure in some regions, including the Arab states, or Latin America and the Caribbean, where for many countries, the aspirations of poor people in their communities go far beyond the indicators included in the global MPI. And so in tonight's, um, today's seminar, uh, Sama Sleiman will be presenting a revised regional MPI for the Arab region. And she will be commented on by Javier Mancero, who is engaged in a parallel exercise in ECLAC in Latin America. So just a little bit about our two speakers um, before we enter this fascinating conversation. Um, Sama Sleiman has been at ESQUA since 2015, and Javier Mancero has been the head of the social statistics unit of ECLAC since 2015. So there's a parallel, but there's also a divergence. Sama has quite a fascinating background. She's an epidemiologist and an actuary by training, a combination I haven't seen before in a statistician. Um, and she really has spearheaded and pioneered a lot of work on multidimensional poverty at ESQUA, but also on other measurement methodologies, for example, an economic justice index or the Egypt governance competitiveness index. But tonight she'll be talking about the Arab MPI and she participated in the original development and in the revisions. Uh, and she also is working on a web-based tool um, to support the computation of, of MPIs in terms of software. So we're delighted to hear this paper and, and the exchange. And her discussant, Javier Mancero, um, as I mentioned, is at ECLAC, and he is also a leader and a pioneer of multidimensional poverty work and has been for many years at ECLAC. Um, and so he looks not only at the measurement of poverty, but also at issues such as income distribution and the compilation and harmonization of household surveys, and then the production and dissemination of social statistics so that they're used in policy. And for example, beyond multidimensional poverty, he coordinated the update of the ECLAC methodology of income poverty measurement, which is also a regional income measure. And now he's uh, leading the work on a comparable regional MPI for Latin America. So this should be a fascinating exchange. Thank you very much to both speakers. And we're, we hope that you enjoyed today's seminar and also the others in this series. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thanking you for this uh, uh, beautiful opportunity uh, that will allow us to present today a final proposal for the revised MPI, the revised Arab Multidimensional Poverty Index uh, framework. And um, while sharing my screen, so um, 
uh, this uh, this uh, regional um, framework actually has been as a, a result of the technical work undertaken by um, ESQA, UFI, the League of Arab States, and uh, UNICEF, as well as consultations with member states and other organizations that uh, um, actively are, are willing to partner with us uh, through time. So this revised MPI was endorsed by uh, uh, the four, 40th ministerial session of the League of Arab States, uh, the social ministerial Council um, uh, very recently. But uh, to begin with, I would like to um, maybe address the purpose of uh, or, or the rationale behind this um, regional uh, measure. Uh, I mean, usually we, we think about an MPI at the national level because uh, policies will be more impactful and uh, more directed and targeted to the, to the people that are flagged to be most uh, mostly in need. Uh, but in, in our region, actually, uh, the ESCO has identified the need to start and ignite a regional discussion on multidimensional poverty uh, really early and during the early stages of the 2030 agenda's uh, conception. So we identified this need and we think that this um, discussion would lead to promote poverty reduction in the region going beyond uh, eradicating extreme poverty. So our starting point definitely was the uh, global MPI. And uh, down the line, you're going to see a comparative of the frameworks and how we, the evolution, let's say, of our work in the region. Uh, but again, the, the, the starting point was the um, global MPI, and we kind of tweaked it and tailored it to uh, the region needs. So this uh, process was actually a series of technical consultations, EGMs, expert group meetings, political consultations with member states, uh, until we reached an, an official adoption by uh, the Arab states in 2017. Later, during the same year, we were, we were able to successfully launch the first Arab uh, multidimensional poverty report. Um, uh, then soon after, we reiterated the consultations to revise uh, to revise that Arab MPI uh, for different reasons. Um, mainly, we have uh, we have noticed a change in uh, in the surveys and the data collected, right? So we saw that uh, there is somewhere a wealth of data that we would like to. Uh, um, benefit from okay ripe let's say and and make it uh, more um useful uh to, to the region in general uh, uh but also it's uh uh it's we believe in continuous improvement um so we would like uh we we wanted to have um uh, consensus let's say on uh this uh a measure that was adopted not only by member states but also by the League of Arab States itself, which uh, uh, had one of its uh, targets uh, from now till 2020, 2030, excuse me, to reduce uh, poverty in the Arab region, multidimensional poverty in the Arab re region by half, which is target 1.2.2 of the 2030 agenda. So um, we wanted this uh, this index to be perfect, to be ideal, and uh, knowing that it is a regional index, um, not directed to very minute specificities uh, of the country, but at least it will uh, uh, give an incentive to member states uh, to, to compare their poverty, multidimensional poverty to other, to other countries, to learn from other uh, countries, how they're addressing uh, those uh, uh, deprivations or, or in the dimensions that have the highest contributions, uh, what kind of policy um, uh, actions they're, they're implementing, so on and so forth. Forth. So this uh, this entire uh, idea is to to create this uh, dynamics, this uh, uh, forum, let's say, of of exchange, of knowledge and um, experience uh, towards uh, SDG one. Uh, so by uh, by 2020, uh, we. Uh, so we reiterated the, these consultations for like a couple of years. And then by 2020, we had a, a preliminary proposal for member states. And uh, we got a back and forth with, again, uh, technical consultation, political consultations. Uh, some member states had uh, certain concerns about certain indicators. Um, uh, we, we discussed and we adjusted and uh, we were able to, again, officially uh, get an official endorsement of the revised uh, MPI uh, by the end, by December 2020. Um, now, by 2021, we're preparing for the uh, next Arab uh, multidimensional poverty report, and we have additional partners on board, such as the UNDP. And uh, the, the next report is expected to be launched uh, in 2020, hopefully. Um, 
now today, uh, what I'm going to present, um, it's actually uh, the results of um, the older waves, let's say. Okay, so these are preliminary results based on older waves, uh, waves of surveys, uh, because the work is undergoing. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to give um, um, then an idea of uh, the framework, the changes that have uh, been applied, etc. Uh, so uh, the revised framework is actually um, is, is no longer three uh, dimensions like the, the global MPI, right? So this was the old framework. We had three dimensions. Today we have five dimensions. Okay, uh, the five dimensions uh, are split into two pillars: the capability or non-material well-being, which will have a weight of 50%, then the living standards or the material well-being, which will account for 50%. And uh, that rationale also uh, was a reflection um, of the situation in, in the region. So um, the indicators did not vary much in, in terms of, of indicators titles, the definitions were tweaked. Um, in the old MPI, we had uh, two levels of, um, of, of, of deprivation, let's say, the acute uh, cutoff point and the moderate cutoff point. And these cutoff points are not the poverty cutoff points, it's actually the definitions of the indicators themselves. So um, we had uh, in, in, in uh, the first MPI, um, the health dimension, which had child mortality, child nutrition, early pregnancy, and female genital mutilation. Um, we had in the education dimension two indicators, the school attendance and the school attainment. Uh, in the living standards, we had a list of, of indicators that were a bit um, confusing for, for policy purposes. If a policy maker, maker is looking at, uh, uh, at this dimension, they wouldn't know exactly uh, uh, what to address unless they go deeper into the, the individual indicator composition there. So uh, also we thought during those uh, consultations that we, we have different sectoral uh, uh, interests uh, of different policymakers. So it would be also good to split them into um, uh, different uh, umbrellas. For example, uh, the overcrowding, the floor roofing would be under um, uh, the housing and we added uh, other uh, characteristics of the type of dwelling, um, which would which would move the, the definition from an acute poverty up to uh, uh, moderate poverty uh, that is mostly observed in, in the region. So for example, the, I'm gonna go back to the definition here, for example, the type of dwelling, uh, um, a household would be deprived if uh, it, it it is deprived in one uh, of, of three uh, conditions, let's say. Either the home is a place other than a standalone house or apartment. So we're talking about those tents, um, et cetera. And if it has no permanent floor and if it, or if it has a non-permanent roof. So this is just to give uh, an idea about the type of, uh, of changes we've, uh, we've introduced to the definitions. Then we have the access of services. We chose to make it also uh, a dimension by itself. Um, because uh, also uh, responding to deprivations in this um, dimension would take different uh, policy responses or policy planning than, than other dimensions. That will include water, sanitation, and electricity. And the last one is the assets dimension. In the old MPI, this asset uh, dimension, uh, it was actually one indicator, and it had a cocktail of um, communication, mobility, and livelihood um, uh, assets that, um, uh, actually, I think we adopted the, the global uh, definition uh, there. But then we thought may as well split it and see exactly where uh, the, the deprivations uh, lie. So um, here, um, based on, the, uh, uh, on, on these two frameworks, we can present um, a comparative, let's say, a comparative uh, graph of the MPIs. Uh, as you can see, uh, the ranking or the order of the countries haven't changed much. Uh, Consequently, the results haven't changed much. At the end of the day, this is an estimation. And um, some of the countries, okay, did, did change order, but it's, it's very, um, very minor. We're gonna see also the headcount. So we know that countries that suffer from poverty still suffer from poverty. The uh, countries that have uh, average poverties and, and those that have uh, lower rates of poverty are still 
within the same clusters, more or less. Uh, same thing for the intensity, but across the board, the new index has produced lower um, deprivations. And now if I want to, to argue why, um, one, definitely it's the definition of the uh, of the indicators, but also, uh, the, I mean, that definition would, would capture more people, it's true, but also um, the, 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 cut off, the poverty cutoff point is the one that changed. So here we had a one third in the old framework, one third uh, poverty cutoff, but here we chose to have it at 20%, which is the number of dimensions, one over five, one over the number of dimensions. So uh, this slide, I don't think I'm going to go over it in details. It's just uh, for those of you who are interested to, to see the rationale behind the changes we've done, we've applied. Uh, we call it as an evolution document that presents um, um, uh, the rationale behind changing uh, right, uh, the, the definitions. For, for example, uh, early pregnancy and FGM. In the old Arab MPI, it was combined together. However, um, it was excluded for comparability purposes and data was not available in most countries. This FGM is not necessarily a problem uh, in uh, in most Arab countries. Actually, it could be a problem in, in just three of them. And uh, countries actually did contest that <laughs> that indicator. So uh, from our perspective, uh, we, we did let go, for example, this uh, variable or this uh, sub indicator. Uh, however, when we go with such member states who do have this problem, we would definitely recommend to include it in their national MPI. So uh, that was kind of a, a common, uh, finding a common ground to be able to um, to um, proceed with, a, with an acceptable framework uh, for everyone. Um, same goes for, uh, for other indicators. Obviously, some, some of the indicators remained uh, the same. Um, so again, uh, some of the preliminary results um, uh, of um, the MPI, uh, the regional MPI would, uh, uh, I mean, we, we tried also to, to, to <laughs> humanify it a little bit more and to put it in terms of um, um, head counts of, of, of how many people, for example, in Algeria are expected to be poor in 2012. Again, I'm talking about old waves of surveys. How many people in Mauritania? So, for example, we know that in Mauritania, if you go, um, so for example, here in Mauritania, uh, the head count, um, okay, so the head count was 91%. Uh, of the population in Mauritania. But in reality, when we uh, uh, compute the, the weighted, the, when, when we take it up and we generalize it to the population, since we're using representative surveys, uh, we notice that, okay, in Mauritania, we have 3,665,000 Arab citizens that are considered multidimensionally poor under this um, framework. And that would, for example, um, be significantly less than the number of people in Egypt that are considered multidimensionally poor, while the proportion or the headcount in Egypt would be way lower than uh, Mauritania. So we thought of, uh, of this as a kind of um, making the problem, um, not a regional problem, but of regional interest, okay, give it a regional perspective. And uh, here, I think where my colleague Khaled might uh, intervene at some point and explain a bit more later down the line uh, about the, the strategies and the regional strategies, the, the regional policies that could be uh, implemented um, uh, under the, the League of Arab States where uh, member states would want to help each other in a way. Um, also, so here we have a graphical representation and we uh, computed a, a regional headcount as, uh, as I said. Also under the new um, revised uh, Arab MPI, uh, we computed the contributions. Uh, here I'm presenting just the contributions of, of dimensions, not to go uh, too much into details. Um, and we see that across the board, we have education uh, as the, mo the highest contributor to poverty. Um, some countries would, would argue that the definition is a bit uh, too strict. So we are asking um, people to, to graduate from school to be non-deprived, right? Uh, so here, um, um, 
maybe in, in certain contexts, um, we need to, to revise uh, this definition. And we, we actually really like the new definition uh, of, uh, of uh, education under the moderate global MPI that was recently maybe discussed by Sabina. Uh, and we think it's very important to, to um, segregate the, the cutoffs within an indicator per age group, for example, or per gender. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so. But anyways, this is the result here. Uh, we have it as, a, as the highest contributor. Uh, then we have the housing, which is significant as well. Then comes um, the assets. So it fluctuates depending on the country. Um, access to services is also significant in the LDCs. And some uh, countries like uh, Tunis, uh, Algeria, and Palestine, while health and ed education uh, does uh, also fluctuate depending depending on the system systems uh, that are um, actually applicable in the country. Um, so now I can um, uh, go a little bit. Uh, uh, about some some robust robustness checks we we thought of um, of undertaking to make sure that okay are our choices sound do they if we if we change some of the parameters uh, would it really affect the country's ranking because as you notice when we changed the framework entirely from the old MPI to the to the new MPI the clusters of countries were still the same okay but but the ranking uh, uh, changed so here in this um, uh, reflection on robustness, we are considering just the country's ranking and we're identifying sources of uncertainty to be three, the choice of indicators and their deprivation cutoffs, which was treat, which was dealt with, let's say, in, uh, in a paper called the internal robustness uh, of the MPI, computing the Kramer's V and other me measures. Uh, but also we thought of playing more with this and um, study more uh, the, the uncertainty um, uh, that comes from the dimensions weights and indicators weights and the uncertainty that comes from the choice of the poverty cutoff. Because uh, we think that these, uh, and, and based on our experience, uh, it's these two last two are really uh, can, can be subjective somehow. OK, so they can be based on on expert opinions or they can be also um, manipulated uh, in a negative way by policymakers if if allowed. So uh, those those two are a bit risky um, since the definition is is usually conceptual and we wouldn't play a lot with the definition just to, to um, I mean, we know the context, we know the situation, we have a, a certain definition for an indicator, but then tweaking the weights and the cutoff uh, could be a bit more problem problematic. So I'm gonna quickly present the process, how, I, how we thought of it, of, uh, of um, assessing this uh, type of uncertainty. And actually we've, uh, we've built a small program or algorithm in Stata that would uh, do a certain loop uh, across uh, nested loops, okay, across different uh, values of uh, indicators weights, okay, and dimensions weights. So, uh, so if my dimensions, I have five dimensions, uh, I might start with equal weights, and then within each dimension, I would play with the weights of the indicators. Okay, then another round where the dimensions would have a different set of weights and then all the possible combinations within each dimension would play around. And then we get a certain set of models and uh, we rank, uh, we get the results of these models. We rank the countries. In that case, we had, we were playing with 11 countries. And uh, uh, once we have those ranks, we compute a matrix of Euclidean distances across all pairs of models. Um, and uh, we sum this Euclidean distance per model and group them by ED score. So uh, several models would give me, would be located in a position that is, uh, uh, have the same distance with other uh, rankings, let's say. Okay, so those, for example, uh, uh, 59 groups here, models here, they belong to one group because they have the same Euclidean distance with the rest of the models. So we ended up with uh, 60 groups, I think. And um, uh, our choice actually is uh, to choose the groups that minimize uh, this uh, Euclidean distance, because we want uh, a set of parameters that if we change it a little bit, 
okay? It would still be in the center. Uh, it will still be uh, not a, an extreme uh, situation or an extreme choice set of parameters. So uh, uh, theoretically, our choice should be uh, one among those two 85 uh, models. Uh, Voila, so the ranking between, uh, just to uh, have a, an insight of what we had, the ranking between the first two uh, groups uh, was was one pair of, uh, one pair that switched, which is uh, Comoros and Yemen. And uh, we carried a little bit more tests. So we, we, we saw that the average MPI difference between Yemen and Comoros across models were not that significant, and that the mean and variance of the MPIs within the first two groups also did not show any significance. Um, um, so, so from here, um, uh, we located also our uh, fa favorite model, which is the, the equal, uh, equally weighted model uh, within, within each dimension. And uh, uh, it was one of, uh, of the robust, uh, the, the best, uh, the best uh, groups. So we were safe to, uh, to assert that this is our choice uh, of parameters. <clears throat> Next, uh, the second one was the poverty cutoff uh, to, to be assessed, excuse me. So we know uh, the easiest way, once I decide on a framework, uh, the easiest way to play with my figures, uh, poverty figures, is to, to just take uh, slightly my cut off to the right, and then I'll be having uh, more acceptable poverty measures. So we don't want that. We want something a bit more uh, robust, a bit more scientific. Um, the, the preliminary definition we came up, we recommend, let's say, for wh when we advise about the choice of a poverty cutoff, um, at the beginning, everyone was saying one third because just the global MPI uses it as one third. But then when, when member states started using other uh, dimensions or more dimensions, we started recommending um, a cutoff that uh, conceptually okay, agrees with a multi-dimensional poverty. So the cutoff should be the weight of a one dimension. This should be higher. Yani, the score should be higher than the weight of one dimension. But sometimes also um, dimensions are not equally weighted. So as a rule of thumb, we're advising to have it as one over the number of dimensions. So let's say it's, I have four dimensions. Here, my cutoff point would be 0 0.25. In, in the uh, uh, revised Arab MPI, it's five dimensions. So we took it to be 0 0.2. Okay, now uh, what the, the question here to be answered, what happens when we start playing with this cutoff point? Again, we took um, a very uh, granulated uh, set or range of, uh, of cutoff points uh, from 15 to 40% with a jump of one. And we started uh, examining uh, what's happening. Now, uh, before, before going there, um, uh, we just wanted to, to uh, explore the, the data a bit more, and we plotted the kernel, uh, uh, the smooth kernel um, density functions for these scores um, uh, for all the, the 11 countries. And clearly, we know that the, the countries that have a, a hump <laughs> on the right, so the, the, they're uh, um, left skewed, let's say, are those LDC countries. And obviously, the uh, uh, countries that have a concentration of um, um, uh, of, of uh, low scores, <laughs> concentration on the, on the low scores are the countries that are doing better off. So uh, where do I put this uh, uh, this cutoff point? What what we uh, what we did here um, is also we ran uh, to start with a stochastic dominance analysis. So we uh, uh, illustrated some cumulative distributions overlaid here. It's, it's a bit tiny, but you get the idea. So uh, some distributions were clearly dominant over others. We know that wherever we we have our cutoff point, this country will rank better than most others. Um, uh, but some other uh, distributions would, would be overlapping at different points. So uh, here we use the Wilcoxon rank sum test, the man would need to sample statistic. And uh, we wanted to test if the cumulative density of uh, two countries is not different. And we actually had uh, just uh, three couples where we, the test was not um, um, 
was not significant, okay? And uh, it, it, it was surprising because when we plotted, so maybe if you have some insights, when we plotted those um, uh, couples of countries, for example, I have Comoros and Egypt, I have Jordan and Tunisia, I have Mauritania and Palestine, okay? Uh, when we plotted them, uh, two of the of the two couples uh, had clearly uh, different uh, non non overlapping uh, cumulative distributions. Uh, the third one was a bit more problematic. So from here, what we did, um, we uh, identified the most robust cutoff points. Um, and uh, the estimates were comp computed for the 26 choices we, we talked about in that range. Uh, and uh, we computed the Euclidean distance matrix again. Um, and uh, the cutoff, the cutoff should, the best cutoff, let's say, should be the one that would minimize the Euclidean distances, that would minimize the volatility in a rank for a country, okay? And uh, in our case, we have uh, three, uh, four, cutoffs that would give the same um, uh, distance, let's say. So these four cutoff points are in one group, okay, that would give the same distance, 20, 21, 27, and 38. Now, again, these are preliminary results. Um, uh, the real work on the report will commence very soon. So uh, here it's just um, uh, presenting the way we're doing things and how we're thinking about them. So in that case, we would safely recommend a cutoff point out of 20. Uh, if I take it down to 19, I have a problem, but if I take it off out to 21, I think we will be fine. But also that is related to uh, the, the um, I mean, the, in reality, the MPI scores are not continuous. So sometimes we have sp those spaces between different, uh, different uh, cutoff points and, um, it, it would give uh, it would give such uh, neighboring uh, neighboring cutoffs would have exactly the same uh, sum of Euclidean distance. Like for example, 23, 4, 5, 6, um, 24, 25, 26, all of them, I think they, they have an empty uh, score in between. So things needs maybe a bit of refinement, but but this is um, uh, this is the idea. Uh, finally, I'm not sure if um, I still have time, you let me know. Um, uh, if I, I do have time, I would like to show you a little bit about this uh, innovative uh, tool that uh, we hope it will be uh, able to assist us and member states during the process of building their national MPIs, use, during those consultative process that um, uh, we will be working on uh, with soon. So. So this uh, portal is um, uh, username and password uh, protected. Uh, it gives us uh, different uh, options, okay? The first option, the MPI central, um, is a where less technical people can play, okay? Or can explore. Uh, the indicators sheet or indicators tab is more for uh, technical people that understand how the logical rules behind building an indicator, uh, how to translate the English definition into a logical code. Mm. The survey tab is where users can actually upload their uh, household survey data. Uh, now, I'm going to start by choosing um, a, a, a random um, country, so let's say Tunis, I have already two uh, surveys for Tunis that and two frameworks that have been saved already. Here I can see all the years that are um, uh, there. For um, just for the for the sake of the presentation. I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, a new framework with uh, Tunis. Okay, and uh, I select the country, the year, then I define my, dim my dimensions. Let's say I'm gonna just replicate the uh, Arab, uh, revised Arab MPI framework. I'm gonna start with health and then education. Then housing. Then uh, services access to services, then assets, okay? And here uh, on the right-hand side, I can see all the indicators that my technical people have built 
in the indicators tab. And also I can see the definition if I hover over it. So for example, child mortality would tell me a household is, is deprived of any child in the household died before the age of five during the past five years. So this would go under health if I'm satisfied with this uh, framework. So I want to include also child nutrition, but in my case, uh, let's say I'm building a new framework, I, I would have the choice not to include all the relevant indicators in the health dimension. Okay, so I'm gonna, for this case, I'm gonna include early pregnancy, school attendance would go under education, age schooling gap under education, education attainment as well. Uh, for the housing, it's gonna be overcrowding and type of dwelling. Uh, for the services, improved drinking water, improved sanitation, electricity, and the last three will be under assets. Hala, when in reality, when we work with member states on, on their national MPIs, uh, we will be having a lot bunch, a whole bunch of indicators to the right, and it would it wouldn't be as as neat and clean as as this one. So the next step is actually to decide on the deprivation cutoffs within every indicator's definition. So for example, if I want uh, uh, my early pregnancy to consider women uh, from 15 to 30 who actually gave birth before the age of 18, okay, I can refresh uh, my data to give me the deprivations and non-deprivation counts. So it's kind of a dashboard here uh, for every indicator. Okay, so it changes, I mean here it changed slightly, uh, but also I can play with the uh, age, uh, for example, the schooling age. Um, I can play with uh, the uh, gap, I can play with the years of schooling. For example, Tunisia, they graduate from school after 13 years of, of schooling. If I'm talking about Sudan, I should take it down to 11 because they have 11 years of schooling before they graduate, uh, etc. I'm gonna leave it, oh, let me put it 11 just like for fun. Uh, so um, after this, I can go, I can click next to uh, start setting the weights uh, for my dimensions and my indicators. So in this tool, actually, we just wanted to, to make the beautiful al Foster method just uh, more uh, fun and more uh, gamified for uh, policymakers who, who do, not, do not have any intention of learning SETA, but would like actually to participate in the, in the process. So uh, we, we tried to, to split it into a few steps. Um, like a wizard that would uh, would help policymakers uh, um, own it more. Also, I mean, once they start playing with uh, with the weights, they start recommending certain uh, uh, cutoffs, uh, certain uh, change in definitions. Uh, definitely, they would uh, have a higher ownership. Now, by definition, in step four, by definition, uh, the tool would give you uh, equal weights. Okay, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Arab MPI, uh, revised Arab MPI, we gave health and education 50%. So each one of them is 25%. Okay, and if you notice, we have, I have those uh, green flags here. Uh, when my score, my total score of the dimensions, oh, sorry, my total weight of the dimensions is beyond 100 or less than 100, it will give me a red flag. So I need to uh, have more adjustments here. I know that the housing services and assets, they have 50% altogether. So I'm going to put 50 over 3 for all of them. And here we go. I'm good to go. I'm not going to change. Um, the indicators uh, waits for now. I'm gonna go to step five. Step five is just a summary step where it presents my framework with the weights, uh, with the definitions, and if you remember the cutoffs uh, that I changed. Okay, so here I, I changed the education attainment to 11 years, assuming I'm in Sudan. Okay, and uh, it presents, it starts the computation based on all the changes I have uh, introduced. Now, when I click uh, Compute MPI, uh, I go to the poverty cutoff. So here I need to, uh, I need some input from the user to tell me where is the preferred cutoff. Um, as a rule of thumb, as I told you, we're proposing a certain number as a poverty cutoff here, uh, based on the number of dimensions the user uh, has uh, defined previously. So if, if they did uh, put four uh, dimensions, this would be 25%. Um, 
similarly, we have some rules of thumbs for the vulnerability line and the extreme poverty line. Um, and in reality, my framework is like this. It will show like this. Okay. Uh, so um, I can either play with it and it will change a little bit. Uh, the, the people to the right of the yellow line are actually the ones that will be labeled as multidimensionally poor according to the newly set uh, cutoff point. So here I'm going to click um, next and I'm going to get the results. Also, the results page needs, uh, I mean, it's, it's preliminary, but we will be having um, more analysis in it. But for now, we're presenting the MPI, the poverty headcount, the average intensity. Uh, we have the number of household in that survey, the uh, individuals in that survey. Also, we have, um, for now, we're presenting the poverty analysis only, but later on, we will be able to, to just with a click, produce the vulnerability analysis and the extreme poverty analysis. Uh, the usual, we have the contributions of, uh, of dimensions, the contributions of indicators, but also we have the decompositions by rural urban, for example, if that variable exists in the survey, um, by gender, uh, uh, by um, head of uh, gender of head of household. And in some uh, surveys where they do have uh, um, a variable about the governorates uh, when the survey is representative at the subnational level we will be producing also a heat map a map of those governorates with uh, with their scoring uh, in the near future we're working on the shock simulation um, option and we currently are trying it on uh, some Lebanon data that uh, actually takes data from 2019 and uh, shock it based on some uh, insights from quick surveys. For example, the World Food Program would, would do a quick assessment. And we know that there is a reduction in education, a reduction in uh, spending on um, a, a reduction in health uh, care access. For example, we know that 26% uh, of the people lost their jobs. We know that um, um, uh, people are actually selling some of their assets uh, to, to have food. So we were able to use those quick survey parameters to shock the household surveys that are representative and come up with beautiful results. Maybe uh, soon we can, uh, we can share it with you. So I think that's uh, it from my uh, end. And I, I give it back to James. Well, thank you so much. Yes, that was wonderful. Both the um discussion of how you've <clears throat> altered the index itself and in general why you've done it. And then the extra tool that, that really is bringing the next level of uh, control into the hands of policymakers in ways that uh, you know, academics uh, haven't, haven't spent anywhere near the amount of time is what people who are on the ground do. So that's part of the really great um, you know, insight that comes from these sorts of discussions. And thank you so much for your, for your really clear and uh, concise presentation. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Javier uh, for his discussion. Uh, Javier, good to see you. You all ready? Yes. Hi, thank James. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here today and having the opportunity to comment on the work by. Uh, my colleagues uh, from the Regional Commission um, in ESQUA. So we are part of the UN family. I will share a, a couple of slides um, with my comments. So let me first uh, like give a brief summary of what I learned from the, the paper I had the opportunity to, to look at uh, some days ago, and also the presentation uh, that Sama just gave us uh, at this moment. And basically, uh, the, the main issue of the presentation is the revised version of the Arab MPI that was published in 2017. So the first question, why was it revised? And the presentation offers two um, main reasons. One is to improve the ability of the index to describe the re regional reality of poverty. Um, the paper mentions that there has been recent progress in the social well-being in the region, but not so much in material well-being. So the idea was to have the index capture this aspect better. And also the index now focuses on moderate levels of deprivation uh, because extreme levels of deprivation are already measured by the global MPI. So it makes sense to 
uh, work more on the moderate uh, level of deprivation. The main changes in this revision uh, that I uh, could uh, understand or capture from, from looking at the paper is that the index now includes basically the same types of indicators as before, but with revised definitions in some cases, and also changes in the thresholds of what constitutes a deprivation. So following the idea of having an index that is more adequate to capture material well-being, the assets dimension is now split into three indicators. And uh, also this higher emphasis on material well-being is also reflected in a change of the weighting scheme. Uh, you have now a higher relative weight given to the material uh, space in comparison to the, the first index. Um, now the weight of material well-being indicators adapt to 50% uh, when it was, which is equal to the sum of the social capability indicators. And also the focus on moderate levels of deprivation implies a lower cutoff than before. Uh, so you will need a lower weighted sum of deprivations to be considered poor. Um, okay, so this is a brief summary of the main changes. Now, uh, what I was um, asking uh, when I was asking to myself when reading is if these changes seem to improve the index or, or not, okay? So um, one of the aspects that I found interesting and relevant is that first regarding the, uh, the increasing importance of material deprivation indicators. We know that household members use different assets to satisfy different needs and giving more visibility to the different types of assets that are needed it's useful to have a clearer understanding of what is lacking. For example, uh, communication assets, having a phone or a computer are becoming increasingly necessary. And also in this new reality imposed by the pandemic, uh, even more so as they have become tools for receiving education or working remotely. So it's, it is a good thing that the index will now show us how much of the poverty level of, and also of the poverty trends once the results are published is affected by the lack of this type of, of assets. Now, as a side comment, um, and this is related to the discussions that we've had also in, in our uh, regional commission at ECLAC, um, assets can have sometimes conflicting interpretations for policy making when including uh, in an MPI, because some assets are desirable by themselves and public policies should aim to increase their availability. This is the case, for example, of the communication assets I just mentioned, because governments can implement policies to facilitate the access to lap laptop computers, for example, to school age children, or to provide basic internet connectivity, for example. But other assets serve more as an indicator of the material well being uh, of, of the household but their link to policy is not so straightforward. This is what usually happens with some mobility assets. Having a car is a good predictor of household income, uh, but it doesn't seem reasonable to expect policymakers to improve access to private ownership of cars, but rather to improve public transportation, most of all in urban areas. In fact, a successful policy that achieves high quality public transportation will tend to reduce the need for cars, which will appear as an increase in the asset deprivation. So uh, this, this is just a side comment or a reflection based on the discussion that we've been having with our colleagues in, in ECLAG and to what extent to include this type of, of you know, polemic assets because it, it could give the impression that uh, the policy action should be then to increase the availability of them. Um, well, and when, when looking at the results, uh, the index seems to keep its capacity of capturing the heterogeneity of poverty levels across the region. And we get uh, headcount ratios which vary from above 10%, uh, uh, slightly above 10% to 90%. So we see that the region is very heterogeneous in poverty levels and the index tends to capture that, which is a good thing. And also uh, the new index compared with the, the, the version from uh, three years ago or four years ago um, leads to a higher headcount ratio. This is consistent with using a lower poverty cutoff and also probably from the other changes in the definition of some indicators. 
uh, the new index also has a lower average deprivation intensity. And I was thinking maybe this one is the consequence of opening, for example, the asset I mentioned in three different indicators, because now the index A has a larger denominator, um, I mean, a higher number of possible deprivations, and also possibly a lower numerator, because when you have several deprivations in a single indicator, the probability of someone being deprived in that indicator is higher. No? So if you open that in, into several indicators, the number of deprived households in each of them could be lower. I mean, this is just thinking about uh, why, why those results. One aspect that I found particularly important is that this index has been devised taking into consideration uh, the dialogue with countries, the political support, and therefore its potential usefulness for policymakers. Um, as with the first index, th this revised index has been endorsed by the Arab Social Ministerial Council. Um, and in this aspect, I would like to mention is crucial. And sometimes for indices that, that are built at the supranational level for groups of countries at the regional or global level, it is not so easy to handle sometimes this aspect. So I think is, this is a, a very good aspect that I, I found uh, worth mentioning and pointing out. So summing up uh, and considering that the Arab MPI already did a good job in capturing several aspects of deprivation in multiple dimensions, I think that the new changes seem to improve the, the index. Now, a couple of comments uh, regarding the contribution of, of dimensions to the overall poverty figures. Um, you see that, I, I mean, I am comparing just these two graphs, I, one from the recent paper and the last one from the, the publication where the, the index was first, first presented. And we see that material living conditions have a higher contribution than under the first index. This makes sense. It follows the changes that have been introduced. Now, the, the participation of health is low. Uh, and the question here is, is it because there is not much deprivation in health in Arab countries? or because what we can detect with the household surveys is rather limited. The deprivation indicators that, that can be included in the index are applicable to households with children or young women. So in fact, we do not know much about the health of all older children or the adult population. And in the case of education, it, has, it had already a high participation and in, it still has in spite of having uh, a weight of 25% in the index, it represents more than 40% of deprivations uh, in several countries. And I was wondering, and, and this already was mentioned by Sama, to what extent it could be explained by adult educational attainment, because the indicator that all household members age 19 and over have not completed secondary education can be too demanding for older population who were raised in a time with lower access to education. Um, also, I think it's, it's important uh, to recognize, uh, or, or, or maybe it's, it's more of a question, if the source of information, the household service, will reflect increases in education after the official schooling years, because uh, otherwise you, just, you will have adults that, even though they uh, may have improved their education levels, after they finish school because of a government program or things like that, maybe that cannot, uh, it is possible that it is not reflected in the, in the survey. Uh, my last slide uh, has to do with a general uh, thought about what the surveys allow us to measure with, with MPIs and doing a comparison with our experience in, in ECLEC. Because, um, in this case, the, the main source of information are surveys on family and, and child health. So the kind of information that we have or, or whose poverty are we looking at is very much dependent on, on this or the characteristics of this service. For example, health indicators will refer mostly to children and young women, okay? In the case of education, also children and young people and adults only for attainment, but we know that attainment is uh, kind of imperfect in this context. It's, it's an indicator that can only improve over time. Okay. And then for living standards, that will apply to all household members. So 
If we're thinking about the well-being of adults, the index will capture mostly the privations in living standards, not so much uh, in, in education and less so in health. We have uh, a similar situation in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, but um, where the, the, the lack of information is, is on the contrary, because we are building an MPI using multi-purpose multi -purpose service, sorry, that can be thought as enlarged employment service. Okay, they are uh, most of all, uh, a lot, there, there is lots of information on employment and also additional information on education and uh, other, other well-being dimensions. So in this case, we have more information on the privations of adults. We, we can uh, take a look at if uh, the work has char characteristics of decent work, if the people are, uh, do have social protection, or if uh, retirement pensions, etc. But children in this case are not well represented. This kind of service do not have information on uh, children's health, for example. And health in general, not only for children, is generally missing. So at the point that we are uh, currently, I mean in the different regions in the world, uh, we still face a trade-off on whose deprivations we can measure. We can focus more on some people than others within the, the household. And this calls again for the need for improving service, ability to capture the privations experienced by different age groups to have a better balance. Um, I know I, I read in the, in the original publication that uh, there was an intention of, of working towards a Pan-Arab survey model that could uh, be uh, more suitable for capturing uh, multidimensional deprivation in Arab country, countries. I don't know, maybe uh, this is also a question uh, for you, Sama. I don't know if you could have some progress on that and because something along those lines would be really very um, important, like to have a better balanced MPAIs across the world. I mean, it's not a matter of how we build them because but but a matter of the limits that household service impose on our work. Thank you very much. Great, Javier. Thank you so much for your comments. In particular, I like the <clears throat> the one about um, about public trans transportation. I really am uh, always looking out for those kinds of uh, of not quirky, pretty straightforward uh, problems that can happen when you focus on one thing and don't have data on the other. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Sama for um, a short response to some of uh, your comments, and then. Um, open it up to the audience. Uh, go ahead and put in questions um, into the chat and or hold your hands up and you can you can say your questions yourself. Uh, but now, Sama. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Javier, for the beautiful review and uh, meticulous points you raised. Uh, I love it so much and I can't but agree on mo most of them. Actually, uh, let's let's start with the transport because it's also a point that we um, have discussed uh, internally. And um, just to give you an example uh, about a, a national MPI we're building now with Egypt. For example, in Egypt, we are not using a mix or DHS survey. We're, we're using a national survey. I'm not sure if you're going to call it a multi-purpose survey, but it's like um, um, uh, health and uh, income expenditure and, and life, living standard, living conditions survey. Okay, and in that survey, they actually do ask about uh, the means of transport. It's not only about a car. It's how you commute. How much do you spend on that? Okay, so in terms of policy relevance, definitely would be including those type of variables in building that transport indication indicator or mobility asset indicator uh, rather than owning a car. Um, because definitely the purpose of this MPI is uh, to, to enlighten the way forward to policymakers to have re more relevant policy interventions. Um, this, um, so I agree it's, it's lack of data. Uh, there's nothing we can do in that type of, of service we're dealing with now uh, for, for the uh, regional uh, report. Uh, but also, for example, in terms of, uh, of health, it's, it's, it's the same. Because we don't have uh, uh, data, for example, about nutrition. And the old, uh, the first version of the Arab MPI, we tried to include this uh, uh, adult nutrition uh, variable, but actually it was only measured for women between 15 and 49. So also it was not good enough. So, uh, and it was not available in all countries. So we just, 
let's not pretend we're measuring that. We, we needed to drop it out, right? Um, we were hoping that the new service would include more and more data of the sort, but the DHS and the mix will not respond to that. So now in, in their region, um, we are having, um, uh, yeah, we, we've been doing the exercise to respond also to link it to the Pan-Arab survey. We started doing the screening exercise and um, um, seeing what's out there, right, in terms of surveys, whether we have access to them or not. Uh, we have a wealth of surveys that mostly are not used. Hmm? And the new waves of surveys are actually including uh, a diversity of, um, of modules, okay, that could be very more suitable to build an MPI than the uh, uh, mix and DHS. So for, for example, uh, uh, since the data on health in, in our current surveys are, are very limited, other surveys would actually, uh, uh, I'm gonna give an example on Lebanon, for example, they ask about the access, access to health, access to health care services, <laughs> access to uh, medication, okay, et cetera. Uh, and here I have maybe a question for everyone. Uh, what are we measuring? Is it an input or an output uh, indicator? Because if I'm measuring my health, uh, is it, is it um, um, I need to go back to the capability. Do I have access to take care of my health or not? Then another layer that we may want to propose down, down the line for new uh, waves of service is the quality of the service, not only the access. Okay, so it's st one step at a time, maybe we can, we can reach uh, somewhere that would um, uh, be yeah, name, um, uh, of a better measure, let's say, if, if we're aspiring for an ideal index, which, uh, there's no ideal index, but uh, a better index, right, uh, we, we can go in, in that direction. Um, as for the education, also, I, uh, I agree that the, the secondary um, to, to graduate from school is a bit too demanding. And that's why education is number one contributor across the board, but also it's a regional priority. We want the, not we, as in member states want uh, their uh, uh, population or the human capital they have to be educated. And, uh, but here also we thought about, uh, okay, so the adults are not educated enough. Uh, what kind of policy, policy implementation or policy actions can we have? Maybe vocational trainings, maybe upskilling, reskilling stuff, stuff of the sort, but how is it captured in the next MPI measure? Under this uh, uh, regional framework, it's not, but we're making sure that in national frameworks, we do actually capture that. We do capture employment, we do capture, uh, in case the, the vocational training, for example, variable is there, we, uh, we actually um, uh, try to, to include those. Uh, in terms of the, um, the <laughs> decrease of uh, numbers of um, in poverty headcounts, uh, I agree. I think it's the assets uh, that uh, that has a low frequency baseline and now has a higher weight, right? So uh, definitely, uh, I fully agree. Uh, this is uh, from my side. I'm not sure if Khaled has uh, some uh, insight about the Pan Arab Survey Initiative, or uh, be because we've we've been working with some countries to just understand the possibilities of of expanding the type of modules we can include to have kind of uh, okay national surveys, but at least they're kind of standardized, right? To to be able to have uh, such comparative uh, measures. Um, so Khaled, the James? floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, um, James. Thank you, Sema. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think basically this, um, and, and thank you very much, Javier, for the excellent comments. Um, and, and thanks, of course, to, to, to James for, for organizing this. This has really been very helpful for us. I, I think um, on the technical side, I think uh, Sama really did a great job. So I'm not going to uh, address some of the technical uh, issues and the responses to it. But let me go back to this issue of the, the Pan Arab survey. I think it's very crucial. Uh, when I first joined ESCO in 2012, I think it was the first thing that we did is we wrote a paper with a proposal for a Pan Arab survey because we real, real, realized that if we want to push this agenda, and, and by the way, the partnership with OFI has been really since then. Um, uh, at the heart of this. I mean, even the idea for the Pan-Arab survey was taken from, uh, I think, a paper with a, uh, with a similar caption. It was like a light survey that was proposed by Sabina at some point. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, for whatever reasons, I mean, to get these surveys to be harmonized uh, technically is one thing. To get the member countries' endorsement to actually do them with overburdened statistical offices and limited resources, another thing altogether. 
So the proposal is there, the modules are there, um, but unfortunately we couldn't get the traction of the member countries to. One thing we managed to do over the past seven years though, is to get them to endorse uh, and own uh, the index itself, which I think is of course an uh, amazing achievement. And again, we couldn't have done it without the partnership with OFI, I have to, I have to say. I mean, the, the whole idea started because we were convinced uh, the Alcare Foster method is a better way of capturing poverty and the need to tailor it to uh, 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 moderate poverty levels, something that now I think also Sabina is working on at the, at the global level. Um, getting the Arab countries to, to, to buy into this idea of the move from money metric poverty uh, to uh, multidimensional poverty, or at least a complementarity of both indicators, I think uh, has been the major achievement. And I think now we're at a situation where we're beyond that, um, where really the, the idea is there and now it's basically the implementation phase. So we started off with a team of like two or three people. Now I think with the network that we have, we have over about 30 people who are actively participating in this in the region and there is the buy-in. So the challenge for us, I think, and this is a question for Kev here as well, is how do we capitalize on, on all of this? and push the agenda at the regional level and at the national level, um, but also taking into account these major limitations that we have in, in the surveys. Uh, and, and it's a very difficult one. It's really very difficult for us to, to find a, a balance here because as we move towards the, uh, from more work at the regional level and we get more demand from countries, um, we're gonna have to refocus on the country level, which is, at the end of the day, the objective. I mean, the objective from all of this regional work is to do the advocacy so we can get the demand from the countries, which we're getting now, and then go back to the countries and, and design the national MPIs. And when we do that, to get back to Javier's excellent point, that the, the narrative changes completely. Because in, in when you're doing the analysis in Egypt, for example, and you have data on access to health insurance, and you add that as an indicator, well, then lo and behold, the contribution of uh, health becomes significantly more than education. And, and so these contextual issues are also very, very important. Uh, so stopping here, but uh, yes, it is an, an important issue. And I would have loved to push this survey for not just at the regional level, but really at the global level. I mean, this should be a, a global product. And it's something that I think we in the UN should really work to, to at least remind uh, countries of the need to have this. It will not just be helpful for the MPI, it'll be helpful for the SDGs if it's, if it's designed uh, properly. Over to you, back, back to you, James. Great, great. Um, we have a question. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time, actually, but we have a question from Sabina herself on uh, basically the tool that you, um, the platform that you showed uh, Sama, uh, the question was, uh, have you checked the survey to make sure that the options that are offered are all technically valid? For example, if you change the group of early pregnancy to ages, you know, 15, 16, is the survey representative in that group? Uh, if not, then that option is really not available um, to, to be chosen, really. It seems vital if this is a tool for the public to pr uh, prevent options that are not technically justifiable. Um, so anyway, what, what do you say? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I got it quite uh, right. So uh, I'm gonna explain what the tool does exactly as uh, to reply to this example. And maybe <laughs> Sabina tells me if, if that was your question. Um, uh, for example, for the early pregnancy, we know that the source of this data comes from the women's file. OK, so the module that is targeted only for women. So we do not have women less than 15 answering on that. OK, so by design, the tool takes all these women to be non-deprived because we don't have data on them. I'm not sure if this answers. <laughs> James, if you if you got the question more, if you can recap it or. Well, I think that it's uh, it really is in in making sure that when you have a policymaker put down one of the available choices in the tool that that actually is reflected by what's underneath in the data so that they won't come back again and say, well, wait a minute, it turns out that my choice I couldn't make, but I could make it here. And what do the numbers really mean? I'm, I'm sure that must be the issue, uh, just to make sure everything is on uh, absolutely clear so policymakers 
um, you know, create a, a, a very strong feeling with the platform rather than starting to doubt whether it's really representing what's underneath. Exactly. So at some point we have a, a cap for these uh, uh, fields, you know, the, the gray fields where mm -hmm. uh, users can play with the cutoff points. So uh, when we build the indicators, because we are assuming or we're giving access, let's say, only to statisticians and people that are really uh, familiar with the data to be able to build those indicators. And once um, I want to allow um, a non-technical person to play with these cutoff points, OK, I'm going to put um, maybe I can show you, but I, we put some placeholders and we specify the minimum and the maximum values of these cutoff right. points that uh, that can be uh, can be used, actually. Well, fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. I see we are, in fact, over our time right now. So I'm going to uh, actually just bring it to a close and to thank all of the participants today, um, everyone who presented, but also uh, was here with us, and uh, to Khalid, obviously, for his his great uh, overview at the end. Um, thank you, everyone, and indeed the the IAP team for for being here. We'll see you next time on uh, multi-dimensional measurement. Thank you so much.